So just because you've been on the show before, obviously, yes. many times. Mm -hmm. So I want to uh, start. We'll get to it pretty quickly. I want to talk about Thomas Sankara. Yes. We've done an illicit history of Thomas Sankara, which was initially just for patrons. We actually unlocked it. We have a, a clip uh, that we're going to play to set this up. All right. Um, of a documentary, a French documentary that was made on Sankara. Uh, but while we're getting that mm -hmm. uh, queued up, can you talk about the different waves and, and if it's true that there's the African awakening of the liberation struggles. We right. played Kwame Nkrumah for yeah. the cold open. Then there's uh, this this burst of light in the 80s with Thomas Sankara. Right. And then today, there's new youth movements resisting austerity, Correct. colonial presence of United States, France, and China. Yes, and tyranny. So because talk about those three waves a little bit. If you all could. right. Okay, very good. Well, the first, actually the first wave you write was Kwame Nkrumah. This is after World War II, because you started early actually. Um, you started asking the colonial power in Britain, in uh, Ghana, where is the promises that, uh, you know, African soldiers, you know, without African soldiers, Britain, France, all those countries were doomed in World War II. Not a lot of people talk about it today. Indians, too. Absolutely. Indians, all of the Diaspora, colonial, all of the colonial, the Caribbeans, Caribbean, all those were, you know. All of them. Yes. That deserves a lot more talking. So I digress a little, but I have to. So for example, <laughs> last year I was listening to Macron, a forget which country is from, a West African journalist asked him, said, well, you know, West Africa is going under intense economic crisis. Don't you think some of these countries deserve like a Marshall aid type plan so they can get going and equal footing with the rest of the world? And you know what his response was? <laughs> he said, money is not the real problem in West Africa. The women are having too many children. Are you? First of all. Up to eight children they're having. That's the problem. First of all, <laughs> I mean, you, I, I just meant to say this, and then please keep going on the phone because he's loathsome. But any time you hear a politician say of anything, it could be as serious mm. as the colonial legacy and economic mm. crisis of West Africa. Mm. But even something like kids' school performance here, yep. if they start with, it's not about the money. Uh, there you go. I can guarantee you that it's about the money. Yes, of course. <laughs> it is about the money. And I was, and you know why I was extremely disappointed? Because I said, this journalist does not know his history. Because all he had to do was say, listen, Mr. President, if you had not recruited 300,000 West Africans to fight in your wars, you may not even be speaking French today. Right. See? Right. Then you would have understood. <laughs> you might still be dating your school teacher, but you wouldn't be speaking French. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my disappointment in that episode. But yes, yeah, so let me go back. Yeah, tell me. All those false promises were not delivered. Uh, you know, Churchill, FDR, all those guys. So Nkrumah became a big time agitator, right? So Nkrumah leads Ghana, the first um, so-called Africa, South of Sahara country to become independent from Britain. So that was the first wave. And that was a unique time in history because brothers and sisters in the Caribbean now also being caught up in that euphoria of independence on the continent, many of them started coming back to contribute, and sisters and brothers from this country as well. Because Nkrumah's vision was to unite the entire continent. And he said, that's the only way we'll be able to survive. Because they wanted our resources yesterday, they will want it today, they will want it tomorrow. <laughs> so we will be turned into neo-colonies. And that's when the term really became very big, neo-colonialism. We will be independent, uh, it will be like a fictitious independent. We have all the trappings of a sovereign state, but so long as the economic policies are determined from outside, it means the politics will also be determined from outside. So that was the first wave. The first wave was undermined because Nkrumah was overthrown in 1966. Uh, US uh, CIA-backed military coup, the generals tossed him out uh, before he was overthrown in, uh, in, uh, in Congo. Lumumba was murdered by the Belgians, by the U.S., uh, and by Britain. 
because they thought if this kind of narrative really takes hold, Nkrumah convincing enough of these newly independent countries to form one unified United States of Africa, and then having the resources of the Congo. And then eventually, they would be able to eliminate apartheid much, much earlier, of course, had the continent been united. Then there's a potential that we're going to lose the dirt-free access to all these resources. And that's what it's all about. <laughs> so Lumumba murdered, uh, Nkrumah overthrown. And then you see a series of coups spreading throughout the continent. All these men with no vision just running the country to satisfy their needs, their immediate needs, and their uh, inner circle. But the bigger thing is fulfilling the interest of the outside world that wants to continue controlling Africa. And is it fair to say that, and, and then we'll get to Thomas Sankara in this next wave, because he comes at the time yes. when the whole continent is, is dominated in many respects by this. Absolutely. What is it... You know, I've been. We'll talk about this more next week with Bashkar Sunkara and his new Socialist Manifesto book, which really everybody should read. And again, it's funny because he, in no way, shies from talking about the obvious, including, I mean, the most obvious is the atrocities of Stalinism and the problems inside the Soviet system. Right. But one of the things that he's very clear about and is is on a foreign policy level, and often for self interested reasons. Mm -hmm. But the Soviet Union was better. In a lot of these things. Well, how does in, the in terms of what? In terms <clears throat> of backing the ANC yes, of as course. an example. So what is the Soviet role? The Soviet real, yes. role was phenomenal in Africa yes. because yes. It, it offered that alternative. Not right. only the Soviet, China. And China. <laughs> and China. Yes. Both yeah. are tremendous. A lot of these liberation fighters were trained right. in Russia, in the Soviet Union then, yeah. or trained in China. And in fact, at one point, uh, China and the Soviet Union were competing to see who would be able to train more of these fighters, who would be able to supply them with, with more weapons. So without the Soviet Union, without, uh, without uh, China, many of these liberation uh, movements would not have succeeded because they would not have been able to secure the weapons they need. Look at the case of uh, Frelimo, for example, in uh, Mozambique, uh, and then uh, the MPLA in Angola. They were not just fighting the Portuguese. They were fighting against NATO. Because even though Portugal was bound by the NATO rules not to use the weapons from the US that it got to use only for NATO purposes, <laughs> the, you know, the US was you know, turning a blind eye. Right. When the, uh, the Napalm, made napalm bombs were used against uh, civilians in Angola, in Mozambique. This is really so. We, we know about the atrocities of the United States in Vietnam. Yes, but Portugal because that was, was also widely bombing yes. Angola and Mozambique. Angola and Mozambique, and there are many. And people can just go on YouTube and Google Napalm, Portuguese, and uh, uh, and Angolan civilians or Mozambican civilians, and you'll see there are a couple of documentaries, horrific, killing hundreds or thousands of, of civilians, and hoping that this would turn the tide against, um, against the, uh, the guerrillas. And of course, you know, that never happens in history. <laughs> you know, you saw it as, I'm glad you brought up Vietnam. That didn't work, right? No. You know, because at the end of the day, people want to determine their own destiny. So they fought the Portuguese, uh, but they, in essence, they were also fighting NATO at the same time. Uh, but they won. They won because they were able to get weapons from uh, China, Russia, and then the neighboring African countries, uh, Tanzania, uh, and all those other countries that had already been liberated, were also training them and providing them with sanctuary and a uh, supply line uh, to continue uh, their, their battle. So, uh, okay, so we have uh, the, uh, uh, and, and you know what, it's actually, I keep going back to Nkrumah's generation because that was profoundly important. Had they succeeded, had they not been undermined, I mean, Imperialism and neocolonialism won the first round, emphatically, completely. Because had only a handful of African countries been able to form a united region, we would not see a lot of the problems that we are having today in many African countries. I hesitate to say any African country is really independent. If you have U.S. Uh, troops based in your country, 
if your finances determined by the IMF and the World Bank, if you need at least more than 50% of your budget, the budget of a country from donors from Europe, <laughs> do you tell me, That's what right. is the meaning of independence? How do you define independence? Nkrumah was such a visionary. You know, when he said our independence would remain fiction, and what we have in African countries, fictional independence. And that's the broad umbrella, and that's the best way to analyze it. So you have civil wars, you have inter-African wars, but all of them are just manifestations of the fact that these countries are not really independent, trying to determine their own destinies. Otherwise, a lot of these issues would not even be here today. They would be dealing with um, um, uh, issues how to, uh, 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 to expand technology, right? To compete on the global market with uh, other nations. But instead, the rest of the world using Africa's resources to build up their own economies. So Africa is not even uh, on the table when it comes to conversations. You know, the sad thing. Uh, I keep telling this to a lot of people, including my class. I say, go back and look at some of the data, economic data. You'll find that in late 50s, at one point, Ghana had higher per capita income. And sometimes these stats are meaningless. But sometimes yes. they are meaningful when you compare it to others at a particular time in history. But in terms of when they talk about five, six, 10% growth rate, you and I know that's nonsense because that only aggregates certain sectors of the economy, <laughs> but the masses could be actually starving, which is the case. But it's a useful Steve figure. Steve Pinker. <laughs> but, but, but it's a useful form to analyze yeah. where countries were and where they are today. So at one level, uh, in the late 50s, or maybe 1960, Ghana had a quote-unquote higher per capita income than China. You know that's not the case today, right? right? right. Because China has been able to, uh, China is no longer a typical neo-colony, right? It still engages in some forms, it has advantages, some, some forms it has disadvantages, and you discussed it a few minutes ago, briefly. Mm -hmm. But it engages on its own terms. You cannot go to China and say, I want resources that are buried in the ground in China. I'm going to mine it and take it to my country to, 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 to build my own industries, and I will determine the price at which I want to buy it. And I also will determine the price at which you will buy the product <laughs> that I make with your minerals. Think about that. So we know that the main example yeah. of this, right, I mean, not just the one that really, I just to me, is so visceral, and to the extent, okay, so if Congo is ever covered in the United States yes. or in the world press, it's going to be, oh, there's more civil war, yep. and there's not going to be any explanation of the context of that exactly. civil war. And people might, they very well might not know who Patrice Lumumba is. Mm -hmm. Or if they said, oh, you know, Mabuti Sesi Seko, who ran the country from the early 60s to 1997, yep. Oh, this guy is so crazy and brutal, which he was. Yes, he was. And he flew to the United States and he did a shopping spree while his people starve. The CIA and the Belgians installed him and Absolutely. we backed him for decades. Let's yep. not necessarily mention that. Right. But then the other major thing that is fueling the conflict as we speak is this. Absolutely. The Colton, is it right? Yes. Explain Coltan. that. Colton. Colton. Congo, I yes. think, um, uh, holds about 60% of the world's supplies. And that mineral, as you know, is used in pretty much every electronic equipment in the world. So think so about that. So it's extracted from Congo, extracted sweatshop from Congo. built in China. Absolutely. Here. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. And then Congo gets probably 0 0.0000001, whatever, <laughs> of any of the value that comes from its resource that's enriching the entire world. So that's one product, coltan. The big one now is going to be cobalt. And Congo has more than 60% of the world's supply as well. And cobalt is going to be big because it's going to be fueling the, uh, the, the, the batteries for electric cars. And electric cars, as we know, is going to be the big uh, wave, the next wave, as we move away, uh, not as fast as we should be moving from fossil fuel, see? And Congo 
if it remains the way it is today, it's not going to benefit from that. And that's what Nkrumah meant. Um, and that's also why I just want to add why you need to start thinking of things like the Green New Deal in a global way. It's a great yes. policy, and we should support it, and all credit yes. to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Right. But it needs to be globally implemented, right. Uh, right. Uh, integrated, uh, practically because you can't deal with climate crisis without global, right. but also because of the it, precisely of what you're talking right. about. Right, but I'm glad you said that. Yes. And if I drift away from no, the stream I was going, try to guide me back. Okay. But because you said that, I have to bring this up. African countries cannot fight this war alone. We can't. It's impossible. It's, um, so let me try to give a local example. Like in this country, if they did not have laws to protect citizens from uh, corporations, think about what, <laughs> what would happen. Well, it is happening. It is happening. Yeah, so it, but imagine if people. the laws yeah. didn't even exist. Yeah, yeah. It would be as bad as Corporate it was. Corporate feudalism. At the beginning. Remember how bad it was, as bad as it is today? How bad it was when it was completely unregulated. Nine-year-olds and the Lowell Mills. Thank you. Yes. And those nine-year-olds are working in the minefields in the Congo today. So if corporations in this country can inflict so much harm on U.S. citizens. Imagine a corporate nation like the U.S., because what the U.S. is actually a large corporation, going to Africa, the continent, unpoliced by anyone. Imagine. I don't have to even give you the details of what is really going on. You know, I think that alone should just be scary at the kind of... So, for example, you brought up the war in uh, Congo. You notice it's only confined in Eastern Congo. Why? Why is it not in the Southern part? Why is it not in the West? Why is it not in Central Congo? Why? Because the resources such as Coltan confine Eastern Congo. And how can you have a quote unquote war while companies, there's a whole list we discussed this, I think, in one of your shows, that people can Google corporations exploiting resources in Congo. Go to Google. It'll take you to the UN website. Yep. It lists all these companies. So even though millions of Congolese are dying from this so-called war, I call it so-called because it's manufactured war. It's a corporate war. From those same areas in the East where millions have died, Western corporations are sucking minerals at the same time. So what kind of war? And that's what fuels the conflict. I Absolutely. mean, literally, the weapons would not be moving right. if that. You've just watched a Michael Brooks show video, and you can watch all of our full main live shows every Tuesday night at around 7 p.m. Eastern time, and subscribe to get all of the clips you want. We're covering the globe. We're focusing on international relations, the intellectual dark web. We're having fun. We're doing deep dives with a lot of amazing guests. Of course, become a patron for the whole thing at patreon.com slash TMBS, or subscribe to this YouTube channel and help us keep growing and get that content out there. Subscribe below.